This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. What's the ideal immigration policy? Just Asking Questions. I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason, joined by my co-host, Reason associate editor, and author of the must-read Reason Roundup every morning, Liz Wolf. Hey, Liz. Hey, Zach. Right now, immigration ranks as the second most important issue among registered U.S. voters and the top issue for Republican voters. Perhaps that's because of the 3.2 million border encounters documented by Border Control in 2023. That's a new record high that's so far being outpaced this year. Crossings have been skyrocketing throughout the Biden years. Perhaps the issue's salience is heightened by the fight put up by Texas Governor Greg Abbott, who continues to erect razor wire fencing at the border, despite a Supreme Court ruling that prohibited Texas from stopping federal agents from cutting through the barriers. Even politicians in blue cities like New York are calling the influx a problem, with Mayor Eric Adams saying that the arrival of 110,000 asylum seekers over about a year and a half would destroy New York City as the shelters became overwhelmed. So what do libertarians traditionally in favor of permissive immigration laws have to say about this? Truth is, there's a divide. So we've invited two great thinkers on either side of that divide to lay out what they each think is the ideal immigration policy. Dave Smith is a comedian and host of the Part of the Problem podcast. On the Liberty Lockdown podcast last month, he said this on the topic. If you believe in open borders right now under current situation, uh, under current circumstances, you're an insane person and you're as bad as a communist. I'm just like not even interested in talking <laughs> to you anymore. This is like too crazy. And so like the answer is take our fucking entire military and put them on our border and secure our border. That sparked the social media firestorm, which included exchanges between Smith and our other guest, Chris Fryman, a professor of philosophy at the College of William and Mary and libertarian meme maker extraordinaire and author of several notable papers about the ethics of immigration. Thank you both for being here. Dave, uh, we'll go to you first. You'll have up to five minutes uninterrupted. What's the ideal immigration policy? Well, let me say thank you uh, for having me, guys, and thank you for picking that clip instead of like one of the clips with me and Bob Murphy talking, or where I sound like a reasonable person, <laughs> or whatever. Um, but uh, but seriously, thanks. Uh, thank you, Chris, and thank you guys for for having me. It's good to be back. Um, well, uh, look, I'm an ANCAP. So if you ask me what the ideal immigration policy would be, it would be that we wouldn't have an immigration policy. And, you know, that's my ideal foreign policy is that we wouldn't have foreign policy. And my ideal economic policy is that we wouldn't have economic policy. I think that if we lived in an anarcho-capitalist society and every plot of land were was either unowned or privately owned, then essentially immigration doesn't exist and people can move to where they are invited and or they can homestead unowned land or something like that. So that would be my ideal. I think the more relevant question for libertarians is under this current very not libertarian order where all of us are trying to move to a free society or at least a freer society than we have, how should we think about immigration while there is this gigantic state, the biggest state in the history of the world that we're living under? And my my position on that has been that I believe libertarians should reject open borders. That is not something that is deduced from libertarian principles. Um, I think basically what it comes down to is a question of government property. Now, obviously, um, the in the border, particularly in Texas, there are parts of the border that are privately owned, um, where the, the landowner, the property owners are explicitly asking the government to serve their one legitimate function, which is the protection of property. And so in that case, I think it's very easy for a libertarian to say that, yes, they have every right to stop um, people from trespassing on their property. And if the, if government is to exist at all, that is their only legitimate function. And so I think it's very easy for a libertarian to say, yes, the government should assist them in uh, protecting their, their property. But 
more largely with the question of how to handle government property, I think many libertarians treat it almost as a given that there are kind of ought to not be restrictions on government property. Now, I know that's not exactly Chris's position, but I think that when arguing against libertarians who don't support open borders, many open borders proponents still almost act as if that is the, the libertarian given, which I just think it is not. Um, government property is um, created and maintained by taxpayers. They are forced at the threat of violence to give over their money in order to maintain this government property. And I don't think that it follows from that, that it's unowned or that it is owned by everyone equally. And I essentially would say that if, you know, like if you were to believe that, then you would get taken in some very strange directions. So libertarians believe, say, for example, that people have a right to do heroin. You own your body, you can put in it whatever you want to. It doesn't necessarily follow from that, that I believe you ought to be allowed to do heroin right outside of a public school, or maybe even enter the public school and do it in the girl's bathroom if you feel like doing it there. The government and government property it is less than ideal by the fact, by the nature that it exists. But as long as it does exist, I think libertarians can support reasonable um, restrictions and I think that the influx of 7 million undocumented uh, illegal aliens during Joe Biden's uh, administration is way beyond the level of reasonable. I would point out that this is it, it's very hard to get good polling on open borders because it's so unpopular that no one even asks it in any of the surveys. I saw one recent poll that said it was something like 7% of people uh, believe there should be less immigration restrictions. Whatever the percentage of that that actually believes in zero restrictions, I'd imagine is a small percentage of that set. The point is basically that overwhelmingly, the people in this country who have been forced at the threat of violence to fund this government do not want open borders. And the government is intentionally allowing millions of people to flood into this country. And I do not believe that the libertarian position is to cheer on the government doing something to the people with their money that they do not want done. So that would be, I guess, how I how I'd open this. Okay, Chris. Yeah, thanks, and thanks to you all uh, for for bringing this together. Thanks, Dave, for debating. Uh, I, as bad as a communist was that the as bad as a communist? Maybe I can convince you otherwise. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think that on many of these points we actually agree. Uh, I, I think is probably will come out during this discussion. Really, the the crux of the disagreement is what counts as reasonable restrictions. Uh, but before I get to that, I'll just sort of lay out a little bit about why I'm an open borders person. And here again, I, I suspect that Dave isn't going to disagree with with what I'm saying up to a point at least. But so I think there is this presumption from a libertarian point of view in favor of open borders. So the idea is something like this. Uh, you know, you own your property, uh, you have freedom of association. And so just as I, someone who's living in West Virginia, uh, am free to invite someone from, say, Pennsylvania to come into West Virginia to say, you know, I don't know, uh, attend a Super Bowl party at my house. It seems like I have the right to do that. Why? I have the freedom of association. I have private property rights. And so if I'm hosting someone in my house, uh, it seems like we shouldn't have a problem uh uh, a problem with that from a libertarian perspective. Um, similarly, if I own a business uh, in West Virginia and I want to hire someone who currently lives in Pennsylvania, they can cross the state border. They can come work for me. If I have housing that I want to sell in West Virginia to someone uh, who currently lives in Pennsylvania, they can move to West Virginia and they can buy that housing. So this is, seems all perfectly acceptable from a libertarian perspective. And so in terms of what an open borders policy it would look like, I think it's probably not too far off from what the current sort of open border policy between individual United States states is. So like I said, if you live in one state, you're, you're free to move uh, to different states. Now, there are some restrictions on free movement that I think everybody's going to accept. So if somebody, you know, c committed a murder in Pennsylvania uh, and gets stopped in West Virginia, then I think everybody's going to say, well, okay, it's perfectly legitimate to restrict their freedom of movement, uh, you know, put them in prison and so on. But aside from those sorts of cases, you're more or less permitted to, to uh, move freely across state borders. And so the open borders position is basically take that model and then apply it to national borders. So if somebody from Canada wants to buy housing for me or work for me, uh, they should they should be allowed to do that. Um, 
And as far as the justification for that goes, like I said, it seems like your rights of private property entitle you to do that. Uh, your rights of freedom of association entitle you to do that. And also just, you know, reflecting on the, the situations in my own life when I've moved, uh, you know, you might move for a different job or you might move to be close to friends and family. You might move because you like the political structures in one state rather than another. These are all equally good reasons to move across national borders. And so, the, the again, the sort of basic picture of open borders is take the current model that we have for movement between states and then apply it to, to national borders. And I, th I suspect we'll get into this more sort of in the back and forth. But I, I mean, I agree with Dave that this the, the idea that there should be no restrictions whatsoever on the use of, of public property is not a good position. So that there, ha there, there have to be some restrictions. And so really the debate is what sort of restrictions are, are going to be justified and which ones aren't. And my, my main objection to arguments against open borders that rely on this appeal to, pro to public property is that in many cases, they would have sort of unlibertarian objection, or I'm sorry, unlibertarian implications. So here again, I think, you know, both Dave and I agree, no restrictions is probably not the correct position. Uh, saying that the state can do whatever it wants in terms of restrictions is also probably not the right uh, position. And so then the question is, okay, what sorts of restrictions are justified? And I think, you know, we don't need a full-blown libertarian theory of public property to differentiate between good and bad reasons for uh, restricting someone's access to the use of, of public property. So for example, you say, okay, we got, we got public roads. Um, what's, a, what's a good reason to restrict someone's access to a, to a public road? You might say, well, if they're dangerous. So if they've been drinking, uh, if if they're you know speeding excessively, you say okay. Uh, you might say uh, no longer should they have the right to access the the, the public road because they're a danger to, to other people. But we can also come up with bad reasons to restrict someone's access to public property. So you might say like uh, I don't know, like if the government says if if you are caught listening to I don't know punk music. I don't know I don't like punk music. But like if if you're caught listening to punk music in your car, we're going to deny you access. To a public road, it's like, well, that's a, that's a bad reason. Uh, I don't think we would we would accept that as a good reason. And so then the question really becomes: Are the sorts of reasons that non-open borders libertarians give in favor of restricting people's access to public property good ones? Uh, and, and I'm inclined to think not. And so I'll just say, I'll give one case, and then I think we could probably uh, move on. But so, like, one argument is that. Uh, you know, we need to restrict uh, access to things like public roads, because if we have high levels of immigration, uh, this will lead to an increased uh, tax burden for citizens or something like that. And there's there's an empirical question about whether or not that, that claim is true. Uh, but more generally, it just seems like we can't deny people access to a public road on the grounds that they're, they might use that road to do something that will increase a taxpayer's burden. So for example, I think most libertarians would say you should be allowed to uh, you know, uh, ride a motorcycle without a helmet on a public road. But that increases the odds that you're going to get into like an accident that, that you know, requires the use of like publicly funded health facilities to fix. And so if the principle or the reason is something like we can restrict someone's access to a public road when we think their use of the public road will increase taxpayers' burdens, that's going to have very non-libertarian implications in a lot of cases that have nothing to do with immigration. So I'll, I'll leave it at that, but I'm, I'm happy to, to go into more depth later. Okay, Dave, uh, you have up to 10 minutes to respond to any of that. Okay, so I um, I agree with a lot of what Chris said. I do think that it's, and this is one of the things that I've been critical of libertarians about on this issue. I think that sometimes we're living too much in theory and not marrying that theory with the real world. So when Chris says the, the example of like, or whatever your example is, but hey, if I have a cousin who lives in in Italy, and I invite my cousin over to my house and say, hey, I want you to come over here, and a government agent gets in the way of that. Well, yeah, clearly that's not libertarian. Like, I invited him over, and this is my property. Who has a right to tell me that I can't invite who I want to onto my property? But however, here in the real world, what's happening is that uninvited people are flooding in by the millions. They were not invited by anybody. And we have caravans in the tens of thousands coming regularly of people who nobody invited. And in fact, every state government is arguing over who can ship them over to the other state and dump them on them, and nobody wants them. And to me, this kind of gets at the, the court, like this is the other side. 
of the argument is that, yes, it is true that from the libertarian position, if you are invited, you should have a right to go onto that uh, person's property. But it's also true from the libertarian position that you have absolutely no right to enter property that you don't own uninvited. That is what we would call trespassing, which is what's going on in a very – so you have a libertarian error on both sides – of this equation. And then the question becomes, well, how exactly with the existence of a government do we best work this out? And Hans Hermann Hoppe, who is very demonized, I think, by uh, libertarians who, who support open borders, um, despite the fact that I really think the guy's worth reading and not just isolating like his most, you know, four, you know, uh, most controversial passages. But his proposal was that we should just, libertarians should support a, a sponsorship. Uh, system where invited people can come so long as someone invites them and vouches for them that they won't be a burden on the taxpayer and they'll be responsible for them and uninvited people can't come. Now that would require securing the border. Um, but I, I think that to me, that's probably the best way to simulate a libertarian situation on in a statist paradigm. So I would say that that's the main thing that, that, that people should focus on is that the real world problem is uninvited people coming, not invited people coming. And I, I, I'll probably grant Chris and agree with him that the amount of red tape and regulation for legal immigration is insane. And that's part of the reason it incentivizes people to not wait in line because it's so difficult to actually go through the process. But the major crises, the reason why this is the number two or in some polls, the number one issue uh, for voters in 2024 is because we have massive waves of uninvited illegal immigrants coming into this country. And then, of course, they're also just being put right on the, the dole as soon as they get here. Um, in terms of the comparison between moving um, back and forth between states and moving um, back and forth between, say, South America or the rest of the world in here. I mean, look, the glaring difference is that we don't have a massive problem of uninvited people moving back and forth between states. You don't see just like 100,000 people marching from Georgia into South Carolina. And if you did, we'd start having a real problem and Georgia would start thinking about and, and, and just expecting government services when they got there. And if that were the case, yeah, there'd be a real political issue in South Carolina of how to deal with this. So I will say that I'm glad we can kind of concede that zero restrictions doesn't work and that there are restrictions that could be bad. So the I think that that in itself kind of destroys Chris's point by saying that there could be bad implications of restrictions because we've already acknowledged that, yes, there could be bad implications of restrictions. There also could be bad implications of a lack of restrictions. If you're asking where exactly we say the reasonable restrictions land, well, I would say that if you have the overwhelming majority, and I'm not, I mean, like you cannot find an issue that Americans are more united on than opposing open borders. Good luck finding, opposing pedophiles, maybe. I don't know what would top the, the 90 plus percent of Americans who are all against open borders. But if you have a situation where you know that, um, that the overwhelming majority, 90 plus percent of property owners do are not inviting these people, are explicitly saying, we do not want these people to come here. We have too many problems. We cannot deal with this also. And we as libertarians know that. And then I would also argue, we can get into this later, that the government is intentionally allowing this to happen against the will of all the property owners. I think that more than meets the threshold of reasonable to be on the side of restrictions in, in that case. Okay. Um, and uh, we're going to let Chris do uh, an uninterrupted response. And then Liz and I are going to jump into this conversation and have a little bit more of an unstructured conversation between all of us. So Chris, uh, go ahead and reply to anything of note that you think Dave has brought up in his rebuttal or introduction. Yeah, sure. So, so I, I mean, I, I think you were you're sort of alluding to this point uh, towards the end of your comments there. But here again, we might be in a that if we had a system where it was much easier to, to move to the United States legally than something like a sponsorship or some sort of invitation program uh, would probably function a lot better. And I mean, but the thing is, like, that might get us pretty close to functionally open borders. So, for example, if, if it were very easy for employers to, you know, post advertisements for jobs uh, that immigrants could apply for, and then if they got the job, they could be sponsored by their employers. I mean, I think that would have that would result in considerably more immigration than we actually have. 
Uh, would it get us to open borders? Maybe not, but I think it would get us a lot closer than, than the status quo. Uh, and, and also there are other sorts of uh, what, what economists sometimes call keyhole solutions to some of these problems. So if the worry is uh, you know, Im immigrants um, you know, taxing uh, public infrastructure and so on, uh, and, and so, you know, being net tax consumers or something like that. Well, one option might be uh, something like an entrance fee for prospective immigrants. So, you know, you move here, but, you, you know, whatever it is that uh, we think is going to be consumed in taxes, they have to pay up front or maybe the government can garnish their salary, something like that. I'm not. I, so I, I still think pure open borders is better than that. But I also think that sort of middle ground position is much better than the status quo. So here again, if we're worried about the fiscal burden created by immigrants, which again, like I said, I'm, I'm not convinced that the empirical evidence bears that out. But if it, but if it is the case, you could just say, okay, maybe you have to pay a, a special entrance fee. Um, and in terms of the invitation, I mean, here again, I, I don't know, uh, like, I, I think that like maybe people in Texas don't like when people from California move there. I, I don't know. Uh, but like, I could imagine people in Texas being like, look, like all these Californians are moving to Texas and we didn't invite them. Well, OK, but I, I still think it's permissible for, for them to use roads in Texas and to buy housing from Texas property owners and to work for Texas employers, even if they're not explicitly invited. I, I think they still would have the right to, to use those roads. Um, and then on the point about it being very unpopular, I mean, it is unpopular. But like, uh, like uh, most of what libertarians say is unpopular. So if we're gonna, if we're gonna, you know, let people decide what is and is not permissible, that's not so good for libertarians in general. Like, forget immigration. We got, like, like, you know, you said we want to have uh, heroin on the shelves of Seven Eleven. Like, that's not very popular either. And so, like, I'm just very wary of appealing to popular opinion in the case of a policy like this. Uh, because I think that might lead to a lot of unlibertarian conclusions. So just to take another case. If it turned out that, you know, 90 percent of Americans, uh, ag which this strikes me as plausible, uh, are against, uh, you know, legalizing certain sorts of drugs. Uh, I'm not convinced that would still be a moral justification for restricting the transportation of those drugs on, on uh, a public road. Or if, you know, 90 percent of my neighbors uh, don't want me to sell my house to someone because they said, well, we didn't invite this person. We don't want this person living here. I would say, well, yeah, I mean, you might not like it, but nevertheless, my property right entitles me to sell my house to this person, whether or not you approve of it. And so I think the same principle holds in the case of immigration. So if I want to sell my house to someone who's coming from another country, if 90% of my neighbors don't like it, I say, too bad. In the same way that if 90% of my neighbors say, you know, I don't want you to marry that person, or I don't want that, you, you know, to associate with that person in your house in our neighborhood, I'd say, too bad. It's not, it's not up for majority vote. So I want to jump in here and, you know, sort of open it up to questions, um, you know, basically that anybody can sort of uh, take a swing at. But first, I did want to pose a question specifically to Dave. So obviously, words are not violence, but I will possibly use some slightly violent words uh, and direct them at you, Dave, because you mentioned this distinction between how we deal with illegal immigration, which I think we'll spend the majority of the conversation talking about, and you bring up a lot of really relevant practical issues there. But there's also this question of what we do on the legal immigration front. And I hate to say it, but when you talk about red tape and all of the hurdles that exist for people to legally immigrate to the U.S., you sound a little bit like a Cato scholar, dude. Uh, what does that look like in reality to you? What is that like if you could articulate your vision of what legal immigration gets transformed into in the United States? What would that what would that be like to you? Well, I mean, I yeah, I'd sound a little bit like a Cato guy because I'm a libertarian and they pretend to be. So I, we I all think sound they might a little be, bit. They might snatch you up and hire you after this podcast episode. I, I'm not sure you're right about that, Liz. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we'll see. I don't. I there don't would think be a I'm mutiny getting... in the streets. All the Dave followers would flip yeah, out. Yeah, I don't think David Boaz <laughs> is giving me any job uh, offers anytime soon. Look, I think that uh, again. Let me. Uh, maybe this will be an opportunity to answer your question and kind of talk about what Chris mentioned at the end there, because again, when you say like what is the ideal uh like legal uh, immigration answer it's it's kind of look to the libertarian 
this is kind of like saying, what is the ideal amount of grain or wheat or steel for a nation to produce? And the answer is just what the market decides. It's it's not a question of there being like, and so this is yeah. what I was getting at with the invitation system. And I think what Chris is perhaps misunderstanding that I'm saying is that I'm not making the argument that because something is unpopular, libertarians shouldn't stand for it. And so, yes, that's right. Legalizing heroin is unpopular. And if you want to marry someone and that's unpopular amongst the people who cares, because that's your right, it's yours. The point I'm making is that this is a situation where under pure libertarian situation, uh, under pure libertarian circumstances, the choice would be for property owners. And so since the government is coming in and getting in the middle of that, in this case, libertarians ought to care what property owners want and what they don't want. And so that's why I think the HAPA invitation system makes sense. There should be a bunch of government red tape. If you are invited and sponsored by someone in the country, then I think you should be allowed entry. Now, if Chris says that that'll get us closer to, to open borders, I don't agree. That would not be my prediction. But I'm willing to roll the dice and say, hey, if it's such a great investment and some of these Cato studies are right and immigrate, immigrants are such a net uh, benefit to the economy that it's totally worth it for these firms to sponsor them, then okay, let's do that. So, My guess is it, it would make immigration look nothing like what it looks like uh, um, today. Well, so how do you square that with the fact that, I, I, I totally get what you're saying, and I, I really like the Hoppe example. I think that's an interesting um, area for us to focus on. But one thing that I'm curious about is, what do you make of the current system today where there are lots of employers seemingly who want to extend invites almost in the you know Hoppe type manner to employers, employees that they want to hire, and yet they're frequently um, stymied by quotas that are in place that prevent them from getting the number of high-skilled or low-skilled workers that they need. How, what do you make of that? Because to me, that's the best possible manifestation in reality that currently exists of what we're talking about should theoretically exist. Sure. So I, I, uh, I'll, I'll just mention this, um, I, which I mentioned on Bob Murphy's podcast, which you might have heard me uh, said, or on the the Mises uh, Human Action podcast. That so I was having a conversation one time with one of the Mises Caucus guys, and this was like one of my, or it was a group of them, like three of them. These are like my guys. These are the guys who wanted me to run for president, who were like all on board with the takeover. But they were open borders guys, and they didn't like that I was talking this way about immigration restrictions. And I was doing uh, their podcast, and one of them said to me, he was talking about, he was like, well, look, we used to have like a family farm. And we would hire like immigrants uh, as as day workers, and like they were great guys. They did a great job, and like, but you know, so what? What's wrong with that? Why can't we? You know, we want to be able to keep doing that. And I and I said to him, um, I was like, okay, well, how about the Hapa uh, proposal where you could take these guys and you would just have to sponsor them. You'd have to say that their their health care can't be you know, serviced by emergency room taxpayers, you know, basically our funnels down to all of us that they, you know, that you have to pay for their schooling. They can't just go to public school and then rely on the taxpayers for all of that and all that. And he said to me, he goes, yeah, but if that was the case, then we never could have made it work. We never could have afforded to hire them. And I was like, exactly. So basically the point I'm making on that is that According to Hoppe, those corporations aren't really inviting them in a true sense. It's not a true invitation because basically the invitation is contingent upon the fact that you have all of these services that for years and years and years, the domestic population has been forced at the threat of imprisonment to fund against their will. And my position is that the, the libertarian take is not that if we believe taxation is theft. That doesn't mean if someone mugs you and takes your wallet, that wallet is now unowned property that is there for the world to homestead. The correct answer is that that's still yours and it ought to be returned to you. And short of it being returned to you, you have a better claim over what should be done with that wallet than someone else does. And what you have right now all around the country, which, by the way, is the if you want to know what open borders actually leads to in the real world and not just like in the economic calculations of someone at the Cato Institute. Well, we've got a little taste of it right now. Here's your, what it leads your to. colleagues, Dave. Well, uh, yes, I'm sorry. I don't mean to disparage my newly found <laughs> colleagues, but uh, well, here's what it leads to. It leads to Donald Trump dominating in all of the polls. That's what it leads to. Under a democracy with a giant government, this is what we're actually going to be looking at. And so th the point is that the it, you have a, a system where there are all throughout the country. I mean, look, in New York City, people are freaking out and the numbers aren't even that crazy. Forget these like border states. You have people who have been living in a town. They've been paying property taxes for the local public school for three generations. And they, um, you know, have they don't have the, the economic means to afford private school on top of the property taxes they have to pay for the public school. 
And now their public school is being flooded with kids who have just been on the most traumatic experience of their life, making this journey uh, to America on foot in many cases, kids who have been abused at uh, horrifically high rates along this, this journey and don't speak English. And the question is, now it's very easy when people are just kind of virtue signaling on social media or something like that to be like, oh, what are you, a bigot or something like that? Or what do you not care about these people who came over here? But I don't know. We all got kids. I don't know if you have kids, Chris, but the other the other three of us, we all, okay, we all have kids here. Like, I don't know. My kids are not going to be in getting uh, going to school with a bunch of kids who just went through this traumatic situation. I die before I let that happen. And it's not because I don't like have sympathy for those kids. Anyway, the point I'm making is I think the libertarian position is that no, actually, the people who have been paying in forcibly, they ought to get the say in this, not what some tiny progressive elite decided is what they want to do to the country. Can I just clarify? Hold on. Can I, I want to make sure that I'm understanding the argument that you're putting forth. You're basically like the public school argument specifically is, hey, look, this is going to create a huge externality. This is going to create extraordinary levels of chaos in a public school classroom once you reach a certain critical mass of influx of students who definitely don't speak the language and definitely are on totally uneven footing than the kids that are currently there. And that really does does everybody a disfavor? Is that sort of the argument that you're making? Uh, not not exactly. I mean, I wouldn't say it does everybody a disfavor. It probably is better for the immigrants well, the, who come the, here. But the, I, the I'm saying native that that's, born kids are all of our kids who've been in that. I, I just want to make sure I'm understanding it. I think we're already there. I think it's already okay. a disaster and it's only going to get worse and worse. I think what is it? New York City. I think I had to spend 500 million extra dollars last year for Spanish speaking teachers because they couldn't hire enough people who can speak to these kids now who, are, of course, have to be admitted into government schools. Um, I think, yes, I think it's going to be a disaster. All around. I think the disaster is already all around us. We can kind of all see it. Um, and I think the idea of like, I, I just don't understand almost how anyone could think if we opened the borders tomorrow, this would not be an absolute catastrophe for our country. Um, but I will say that the libertarian position is not just a purely like in the same way that like, if five homeless people showed up at my doorstep right now and went, hey, you know, like, can we please stay here? We have nowhere to go. And I have room in my house for them. But the answer would be no, because this is my house and this is for my family. And the libertarian position is not, well, what would be best for everyone involved or what would be like the charitable thing to do? The libertarian position is that it's my choice because it's my house. And that's not perfect when a government exists. But it's better that the taxpayers should have some say in it than just the ruling elite. Let me ask Chris a question. And I do want to return to the question of welfare and public services and these much maligned Cato studies. I have pulled some of the actual data that we can look at and, and analyze in a little bit. But first, I wanted to ask Chris, it seems like Dave is laying out um, his second best solutions, second or third best solutions. He's putting aside the question of what is the ideal libertarian or uh, anarcho-capitalist uh, immigration system and saying, given the reality we have, this is what I propose a sponsorship based system, which seems kind of like visas, but like way, way be beefed up where you, you have much more responsibility for whoever you're sponsoring. Do you have any second best or third best policy ideas, mm. given that we're not living in the libertopia where uh, the, the federal government only exists as a security apparatus to like protect property rights or something like that, given that that's not the situation we're in? Um, do you have, uh, you know, some specific policy solutions short of abolish borders that you think would, you know, be a positive outcome from a libertarian perspective? Uh, I do actually, although let me actually just say a few things about uh, uh, Dave comments. So first, I, sure. I, so here again, I think sort of my main worry about a lot of the objections to open borders is that they end up having very non-libertarian implications in, in other contexts. So for example, like I agree if somebody knocks on your door and they say, hey, can I, can I stay here? You're under no obligation to let them uh, stay here. Uh, stay in your house. But you have, I mean, you have much stronger rights to control what happens in your house than the government uh, has to control what happens within its borders. So like, if somebody wants to come into my house and distribute communist pamphlets in my kitchen, I could say, oh, you can't do that. 
Uh, but you know, if some or like you know, wave communist signs in my kitchen. If somebody wants to like wave a communist sign in a public park. I, th I think they should be permitted to do that. So I, I just think like the house nation analogy uh, has some problems. Um, and, and then to the point about so, so the the point about collective property or public property is is well taken. So it's you know, as you said, it's not just that people dislike open borders. It, the idea is that like in some sense they have property rights over roads, etc. And so, so like we could maybe speak loosely of, of taxpayers as, as like the, the owners of the roads and so on. And so you say, well, if you, if you own this thing, then you are the person who has the say over what happens on this thing. But here again, I kind of worry that that would have unlibertarian implications. So just to take like a, a hypothetical, if uh, a majority of Americans said, look, uh, we don't want libertarian literature being transported on public roads. I think I, I think you should still nevertheless be permitted to distribute or to transport libertarian literature on public roads. So like the mere fact that a majority of taxpayers want public roads to be used for a particular purpose or not used for a particular purpose isn't enough to show that that's that that's the correct policy, because you can imagine all sorts of really bad policies uh, coming about as a result of that. And then now to, to the second best solution. I mean, so so if the justification or the rationale for the, the sponsorship idea is is like, look, uh, I'm really worried about the fiscal burden uh, imposed on citizens if we have a lot of immigration here again, I'll just I'll bracket off the the empirical question. Uh, here again, you know, there's this issue about uh, th there are citizens who do things which increase the fiscal burden uh, on other citizens. And so for the sake of consistency, would we restrict those sorts of things? So here again, uh, should we not allow people to ride on a public road? Uh, without a helmet because they could get really injured and need publicly funded health care. To the school point, you could imagine somebody uh, having a kid and they don't uh, pay enough in taxes uh, to cover the costs. It's not clear to me that the libertarian solution there is to restrict uh, their right to have a kid. In fact, I would say, no, they, they should have the right to have a kid, even if it does turn out to be sort of a net fiscal burden on taxpayers. And so here again, it's like, you know, the reasons that are typically given in defense of immigration restriction also lead to other conclusions that libertarians aren't going to want. And so when it comes to the second best solution, I would go back to the, the sort of keyhole point. So it seems like for all of these objections, they can be accommodated without significant immigration restrictions. So again, if, if the worry is something like the fiscal burden of immigrants, you could say, okay, pay like an entry fee, or, or you know, maybe the idea is that uh, the government garnishes the, the you know their salaries while they're, while they're here to pay for whatever sort of uh, extra government services they consume and so on. Again, that's not my ideal, and I'm not convinced it's needed in the real world. But I think something like that would be much better uh, than just saying you're not permitted to come into the United States entirely. Can I just uh, respond to a couple of those uh, uh, yeah. points? Because I do think yeah. that there's like, it, we're kind of getting it kind of at the, the core of this a little bit here. So, well, first, I, I don't think the um, the example of like uh, um, not allowing people to have kids or something like that doesn't exactly hold because that's a violation of natural rights. That's uh, kind of on a different level that libertarians can reject offhand. I do think your example of, um, uh, say, if the overwhelming majority of the public didn't want libertarian literature in public spaces or something is a, is a good um, analogy. Because, um, by the way, just to the point about having kids, like being told you can't come into property that you don't own isn't a violation of your natural rights, whereas being told you can't have children is. So there's, there's a distinction from the libertarian perspective there. But I think like, look, we kind of got at this already. Yes, you can reducto ab absurdum this in either direction. And so, of course, there can be standards on government property that wouldn't be good. I'm not saying that like what the people want is a perfect libertarian standard. You know, you mentioned being consistent here. The point I'm making is that the only consistent approach is is anarcho-capitalism. And me and Zach and Liz kind of talked about this a bit last time I was on the show. And I think even Zach conceded at one point, uh, Zach's a minarchist, but you did concede that like, yeah, there's an inconsistency in not being an anarchist if you're a libertarian. You're saying, hey, look, I don't like monopoly. I don't like monopolies, but I will, I kind of want one monopoly on all of the most important things. And maybe that's correct. Maybe you're right and I'm wrong and it would be a disaster if we didn't have that. But the point is that once government involved is involved, there's always these inconsistencies. After all, government is an appropriating self-defense force. Dave, right? like 
Zach is like three months away from being an anarchist at, once you talk to him, and he's about three months away from being a Catholic, which is what I want, right? Like we're both working our conversion angle with Zach over we're there. Gonna have you, we're going to have you a Catholic and cap. You're going to be Tom it's Woods be by the end of this show. galaxy brain so uh, soon. We just have to be really patient in the meantime. Well, but, but look, so the, the, the point is that there are these inconsistencies that you're always going to have. And so, yes, you're right. This could lead to very bad uh, outcomes. But again... The idea of treating government property as something that ought not have restrictions or something that is like, like you can reducto absurdum it the other direction also. And so, yes, you're right. Would it, it we could probably all agree that uh, if you were to say you cannot bring drugs on any public road in the trunk of your car, eh, you kind of de facto have the war on drugs again. Even if you are saying that drugs are legal, we're kind of right back to that same place. However, that doesn't mean that in the middle of a courtroom, you can just pull out a needle and shoot up heroin and they can't be like, hey, get the hell out of here. You can't do that here. So like, again, we're back to like reasonable. What is reasonable? And I would say that the, uh, the current situation, again, look, for example, and this is one of the things that really turned Murray Rothbard around, who was once an open borders advocate and changed his mind later in life, was that it came out after the fall of the Soviet Union that the, the Russians were flooding ethnic Russians into their satellite countries. And th by the way, this is one of the major reasons why there is the conflict in Ukraine to this day, because there's a mix of ethnic Russians and ethnic Ukrainians. And why are the ethnic Russians there? Because Stalin sent them in to break up the national sovereignty of the country. Now, would a libertarian sit here and say that the correct answer is, yep, got to let that happen. Or maybe even we should cheer it on. We should, oh, they, he's just enriching them with diversity. It's like, no, there there has to be some point, and you could, again, to the reducto ad certum thing, if there were, theoretically speaking, and I know this is a crazy hypothetical, but like if, you know, uh, Pakistan threatened to nuke India, and then 500 million Indians all fled, and they all wanted to go to some nearby country, is it the case that libertarians believe that the people of that country have no, that's it. They just have to give up their way of life. They have to give up their culture. They have to give up their nation because, hey, you can't have anything short of open borders. I don't think that's correct. And so there are absurdities on both ends of this spectrum. Yeah, I, I've got a question for Dave about his framework, but I do want Chris to answer that question that he posed um, about, you know, the security risks of um, a, a extremely permissive immigration system. Um, I was looking in preparation for this, I was looking at a House Committee on Foreign Affairs report, and they reported 1.7 million known gotaways uh, last year. So that's people who, you know, they saw them come to the border and then they just, they just got into the country. Um, and uh, encounters at the border in fiscal year 2023 increased over 40% since 2021. Um, and some person, you know, once you start getting so many people coming to the border, then inevitably you're, the government is going to lose track of more and more people uh, because they're either letting them in on awaiting asylum claims, on parole, whatever. Um, so, I mean, should we be concerned from a security perspective um, that the government, uh, as is, just cannot handle uh, something approximating like open borders. Was that a question for me? That was for you, Chris. And then yeah. I have another question back to Dave after this, but I want you to, I want you to address the kind of the point that he was raising and buttress it with a little bit of like the real world data. Yeah. Well, so first, uh, in terms of the the security risk, I mean, immigrant immigrants um, commit crimes at a lower rate than Americans. So, like, I'm not particularly worried about crime as a result of immigration. But I do think, you know, like I said at the outset, to say that you're open borders doesn't mean that there are no legitimate reasons for restricting access. So, if if somebody is, you know, a wanted violent criminal, I think that's a perfectly fine reason to restrict their movement. But here again, that doesn't really have anything to do with the national border. So if a, you know, an, a, a known wanted criminal is walking down the street in front of my house, it's perfectly permissible for the cops to restrict their freedom of movement by, by putting them in prison. So that's not a, na a national borders thing. It's just sort of a general moral principle thing. Um, but, beyond, but hold on just one second, because yeah. uh, beyond just um, you know, a known criminal, um, Dave is bringing up the situation of kind of... Uh, you know, and in almost an intentional, you know, flooding of 
undesirables into a into a country. You could imagine, you know, a, a foreign regime kind of forcefully pushing either their problems or people who they want to make problems into the country. How would a libertarian immigration system cope with that sort of thing? I mean, it, it depends on the particulars. So if the idea is that, you know, the, the immigrants will come into a country and they'll practice different customs and different religions and speak a different language, like, who cares? I don't like that's that's not a problem. If we're talking about something like, again, like violent crime or, you know, whatever, th that's a different story. But, but I think it's uh, a little know. bit different than that, right? Like, it's just like, for example, like, I don't know, China has a lot of people, right? A little bit of an adversary uh, to the US, at least if the TikTok banners have their way, um, you know, in their telling, China is definitely an adversary, which is, you know, a take that I very much agree with. Um, like what would happen theoretically speaking if the US opened its borders tomorrow and we have you know more than 300 million people okay but say say just hypothetically speaking like 300 million chinese nationals just like flooded across the border like surely that would have an impact right are you like how do you look at that chris so yeah so i mean so right we can imagine fantastic scenarios under which open borders would have bad consequences but you could imagine the same for anarcho-capitalism. So suppose you have super strong absolute property rights and a meteor is about to destroy the earth and the only person with the weapon to destroy the meteor refuses to use it. Does that mean that it's so like, can we violate that person's property rights? Well, you might say maybe. I mean, if you're super consistent and or, or you're, uh, you know, you think property rights are really absolute, you say, no, we just have to let the, the earth be destroyed. Uh, I, like, I think that's sort of a crazy position. And so you might say in really wild scenarios, you can make exceptions to rules that generally work pretty well. So you might say like, OK, I can make an exception to the to the private property rights stuff in the in the meteor scenario, because it's like, yeah, like it's it's to prevent a catastrophe. And if we're like, oh, you know, uh, you can imagine uh, a billion people coming to the United States tomorrow with the intention of sabotaging the United States government. I say, oh, OK. Uh, then I'll make exceptions. But then uh, like I'm I'm still sort of on a par with anybody else who has to make an exception to their view in really wild scenarios. But I'll also say like here again, you could, yeah, I mean, the TikTok thing I think is actually a really interesting case. So suppose you have a foreign government that, uh, you know, is, is printing, you know, socialist literature or not even like printing socialist literature. They're, you know, they're posting it on the internet and stuff like that. And suppose this is changing the minds of many Americans towards mm -hmm. socialism. Would that justify uh, restricting Americans' rights to consume that media? So it's it's the same sort of dilemma. I mean, maybe you say yes, um, but but if you if you say no in that scenario, then I think you should also say no in the case of immigration restrictions as well. Dave, I want to linger on this point for just a second because the Russia-Ukraine example that you brought up is, I think, a really good, it's a really good point. Um, the thing that I'm curious about it with it, though, is, I mean, first of all, there's a whole bunch of reasons why the war in Ukraine is happening. I think that the fact that the sort of former Soviets have such fractured, weird national identity where there's a lot of sort of mixed allegiances and even in families where, you know, it's very much like ethnically half Russian, half Ukrainian, different cultures coming mm -hmm. together. I mean, the fact that the Soviet Union was broken up so recently, you know, all things considered, leads to this type of story being repeated all over, um, like the Balkans, for example. I mean, you have like Moldovans who are like a little Moldovan, a little bit Romanian. Actually, there's something else altogether. And it's like, like, this is a very common tale. So this challenge with figuring out what their actual national identity is, is pretty much never very clear cut there. But the thing that just came into my mind as you were talking about that and the Russians flooding into Ukraine was this question of, well, how many Russians escaped a pretty terrible fate uh, in their native country and were able to have their lives improved? And, you know, obviously you can try to weigh that question of, well, how many lives were improved versus, you know, how do you weigh that moral good against the fact that perhaps you can attribute Ukraine's destabilization to that influx, right? Like that's a very, and now their lives are going to be, you know, made shit essentially as a result of this war effort. But like, how do you, how do you take into account the fact that yes, this migration just has huge costs and huge benefits? The lives of those individual Russians who flooded into Ukraine were made a lot better for a lot of decades. 
Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I mean maybe not anymore, right? Like it's hard. Well, Ukraine's to... Ukraine is one of the biggest losers of the 20th and 21st century. I mean, you can you don't can't go too many years without another disaster there. But no, better listen, than by the life way, under Stalin, no. Well, they I mean, were still under. They were still I mean, under. Yeah, him. they were. They, they were, were still. They were still complete. Too. I mean, yeah, but, yeah. No, Ukraine. Ukraine you, had it pretty rough under the Soviets. Yeah. Um, but what do you make of this question of well, like, well, but there's winners and sure. losers in these things. Well, that, there's no question about that. Um, so, and by the way, I was not at all suggesting that this was like the only factor that led to the war that yeah, broke out yeah. in 2022. I've spoken at length about what I think the major factors were. I'm just saying that this is one of the major factors why, like, you had this territory, particularly in um, the eastern portion of the country and Crimea and the Donbass region and all these yeah. parts where there's large, uh, uh, there's large groups of ethnic Russians. This is why they're there. And the anyway, the um, there certainly are winners um, in in like open borders or de facto open borders or whatever you want to call the numbers that Zach was just reading off from the last uh, few years. Um, and I would say that for the, for the most part, a lot of the people coming are, are winners for getting out of the country they were in and coming here. I mean, I think it's certainly true that they're going to, if they're allowed to work, uh, they'll be more economically productive here than they would have been in their home country. Um, now I don't know you know, there are a lot of them go through hell to get here. So I don't know if it's as clear cut, but there's no question there are winners. Um, I think that the Democratic Party is banking on the fact that they're going to be winners politically, ultimately from this. They used to, before there was this thing well, called- Let's not even get to, like, I'm so not even interested in the question of like how this affects voting outcome, like electoral outcomes. I understand no, that this is relevant to-, to that's pretty what? relevant to the conversation. I mean, if you're asking who but, the winners and losers are, this is one group that is banking. They were openly saying this for years until they decided it was called the great replacement theory and you weren't allowed to talk about it. But I, I'm old enough to remember when everybody on MSNBC was bragging about the browning of America and how this would be the end of Republicans ever winning national office. And it is bit, worth noting that uh, we've seen the shift uh, among Latino voters to start. Yeah. There, no, listen. Well, right, I was so say it hasn't necessarily worked out To be clear, yes, to be clear. There was well, no plan. I'm saying they were betting on this almost kind of racialist yeah. plan. I'm not saying that it's necessarily going to come true. What I I'm saying, you. though, so here's what I'm saying, not not in that we shouldn't ever talk about this or engage with this or care about it at all. I think, A, it's a way for these conversations to very frequently get derailed. But B, the other thing is like it's a little bit of a mixed bag to attempt to project out how exactly a theoretical uh, influx of immigrants under our proposed ideal immigration system would ultimately affect electoral outcomes, right? Because especially we have, you know, the massive sort of Republican Latino pivot underway right now. And so there's a little bit of this liberal pundit misfire here in terms of are these future Democratic Party voters? Mm -hmm. eh, maybe not so much, right? I agree. Yeah. Well, could we well, put could that I... question to Chris, though, because I'm curious, you know, this is something you hear a lot is that um, you hear it a lot from Republicans. Sometimes you hear it from libertarians that uh, certain demographics of immigrants tend to vote for big government. And so it's like the self-inflicted wound if you're uh, implementing a policy where you're allowing people who are going to we're, we're in a democracy and you're just allowing the numbers to be stacked against liberty this is a dumb policy. What is your response to that line of argumentation? So, so I mean, here again, there's an empirical question. I, I mean, Alex Narasta has, has written about this where it's it's not at all clear that increased immigration actually leads to, to bigger government. It, in fact, it might even be the opposite. Uh, but but I'll, here again, I'll bracket that off and like talk about, the, you know, sort of the principle of the thing. So really the question is, can we restrict people's freedom to promote an electoral outcome that, that you like? And I think generally speaking, the answer is no. So just to, to give another sort of case, so suppose you're worried that a, a lot of immigration will lead to Democrats winning elections, whatever the case may be. And we say, okay, well then, you know, we're going to restrict immigrants access to, to public roads because we don't want Democrats to, to win the election. That also is an argument for not allowing Democrats to uh, drive other Democrats on a public road to a polling place on election day. Because if you let them do that, then that's going to increase the odds of a Democrat getting elected. And here again, I don't think any libertarian is going to say Democrats should not be allowed to drive other Democrats to vote on the grounds that we want to stop Democrats from getting elected. So I don't see why the immigration case is different. It's the same. Okay. Principle. Can I just, uh, can I respond yeah. to a couple of these things just real quick? Because I was at, um, uh, I was at a uh, LP um, event a couple years ago where Alex gave a presentation and he was, uh, he was remote 
uh, I was there speaking live, but he like gave a remote like by Zoom presentation. And this argument that the, that Im there there is no empirical evidence that immigration has led to bigger government is just flat wrong. And the way he gets there is he argues that the he he uses the um, government spending as a percentage of GDP, and then tries to line it up to when there were the biggest waves of immigration. And the major problem there is that measuring government spending as a percentage of GDP is stupid and completely irrelevant and has nothing to do with anything. The only question that libertarians should care about is if the government is getting bigger. If the government got bigger, but the economy also got bigger, that doesn't mean the government isn't getting bigger. It's kind of like if I was making $100,000 a year and I had an alarm system and two guns, and then I got a big raise. Now I'm making $600,000 a year. So I bought four more guns and I went, I have less guns now as a percentage of my income. It's like, yeah, but you have more guns. This, so it's just not true. According to Cato themselves, the three states with the highest native born populations are New York, New Jersey, and California. According to Cato, the three least free states in the union. So I think it is a question, an empirical question. And I think the answer is that mass migration does not lead to smaller government, does not lead to an increase in freedom. Now, this again, it's your next point, Chris, about like, yes, if we could, um, uh, if we could not have mass immigration, let's just say hypothetically, and I'm not even saying this is the case, but let's just say hypothetically, they were all going to come in and vote for socialist policies. And you're saying, yeah, but being logically consistent, if we were to just stop people on the streets from voting for uh, somebody that would also stop them from voting for socialist policies. Again, this is where I think libertarians are way too married to uh, theory and way too divorced from the real world. The fact is that stopping people on the streets uh, and guessing who they're going to vote for and then shutting down their right to move or something like that would basically make us a totalitarian nightmare. Having border restrictions would make us like every single other country in the history of the world. And there, it's almost like this, this is just marriage to pure theory that, and, and not marrying it to the world around us. It's different. I'm not saying in an ideal ANCAP uh, uh, society it would it would be different, but it is it, under our current situations. One more point I would I would make is that Chris said a little while ago there was this thing about when we were asking about the the hypothetical, which I understand your point about like look these hypotheticals are are very unlikely, but you have kind of relied a lot in in this debate on well if you're saying this then it implies this and if you're saying that we could stop people on public property for this then it could imply that we could do it for this other bad reason. And you kind of mentioned when there was this idea of if hundreds of millions of people were going to come into the country or whatever, what's really the issue if they have different cultures, if they have different practices, who cares about that? And I think this is where libertarians sometimes add in this kind of extra libertarian uh, cosmopolitan um, worldview and kind of insert their own preferences in there. Because when you ask the question, who cares about this? Well, the answer is lots and lots of people. Lots of people do care about this. In fact, way more people than care about libertarianism, unfortunately. Um, I wish that I, wasn't the case. Uh, but I, yeah. no, well, I'm just saying, well, I mean, okay, changing, go ahead. drastically changing the culture of a country is something that a lot of people really do care about. And that's something that libertarians have to grapple with. And the libertarian position is not that they have the right to impose that on other people, but if it's being imposed on them and it's something they care about, I do think that's something libertarians should recognize. In, in other words, just for example, if you think of like the Amish or something like that, I don't particularly like that, like the idea of living like that. I'm from New York City. I like lots of different people and lots of different cool restaurants and lots of different people from different backgrounds. But from the libertarian perspective, they have their right to maintain their culture if they want to. You um, so there's a couple things. So, so can I... Couple Briefly, yeah, but let, let, yeah, <laughs> let me just clear up, uh, uh, clean up one thing though here, which is uh, we referenced a study from Alex Narasta of the Cato Institute, which um, I don't have on hand, but we will link that uh, in the show notes so that people can uh, dig into that and decide for themselves. Uh, we will also, in just a moment, uh, get to some of the empirical data. But uh, Chris, go ahead and respond, and then I have a question for Dave um, about kind of the, the framework that he's set up uh, to justify immigration restrictions. But go ahead, Chris. Yeah, so just a couple of thoughts. So, so right, so I mean, you, you could imagine very bad consequences coming about as a result of like cops stopping people on the street and asking them if they're gonna vote for, for a socialist or whatever. But I mean, there's certainly practical things that could be done on the margins to restrict vote. So he's like, uh, you know, there, there's, uh, you know, uh, an area that has lots of uh, registered socialist voters. 
and you like put up roadblocks or something like that on election day, like on the margin that would have, and it's public property. And on the margin that could reduce the likelihood of a socialist leader getting elected. I don't think that that's justified even from a libertarian perspective. And in terms of the, the culture point, I mean, here again, people can, can have ask, whatever. I'm sorry, can I just ask why not? I, I'm just, just, you just mentioned that, why wouldn't that You're be just justified? just asking questions, in fact. That's, that, that's all. Oh, well, from, from the libertarian it, perspective, why would that not they, be justified? Could they do it to, in, in uh, regions with lots of libertarian voters? Yeah, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> no, why, why, no, but I'm asking you the question, the... why is it? But I, I just don't, I kind of reject this idea that from the libertarian perspective, that's kind of like equally the same, like me voting for everyone to be free or someone voting to take away the freedoms of everybody. Why is that equal? So I, I, I'm not, so I'm not saying it's equal in terms of outcome. I'm saying it's equal in terms of your right to do it. I disagree. I don't think voting rights are a natural right at all. And I think if you're well, trying to vote to take away the rights of everybody else, screw you, man. I don't care what was done. To, I mean, I don't. The idea of putting up roadblocks has other problems involved in it. You know what I mean? Like someone's trying to get their kids to school or something like that. But I'm just saying, like in this abstract theory, like I don't believe that. Like if I'm if I'm try, voting for everyone to have their freedom and someone else is voting for everyone to be a slave, that like, well, we all have our equal right to do that. I'd, I'd so be for any voting. policy that reasonably could stop them from doing that. For, forget voting. Should we restrict the importation of socialist literature? No, that's different. Why? Why? Because because socialist literature is reading a book. Voting for socialism yeah, is yeah, literally so forget, for, forget voting. Take voting off the okay, table. Okay. We well, that's that's where I took issue with it. It's not a right, yeah. and you're trying to enslave everyone. Well, let's bracket that. But but so no, so so but so you agree that people should be permitted to transport socialist literature on public roads, even though that can increase the odds of socialist political outcomes. Yes. Okay. So then, why why can't immigrants travel on those roads, uh, even if they m might again? You know, I'm not endorsing this view, but if, if the objection is so, we should restrict the use of public roads when we think that restriction will lead to better political outcomes, that has all sorts of non-libertarian implications. That's sure, but that's not, that you can't transport that's not the argument I'm making. So the clear difference there is that they're goods versus people. And so if you uh, were, if you're transporting goods, I mean, at least in theory, there's somebody who sent it and there's somebody who wants to receive it. It was a voluntary transaction. Now, I agree. I may not like that literature very much, but at the same time, I've read a ton of socialist literature myself. Lots of people read socialist literature and don't become socialists. Um, so the difference between goods and people is that, again, going back to what I said in the beginning, when you have this massive influx of immigration, these are people who were uninvited. It's not like somebody in the country who has some legitimate claim over any of the property said they wanted these people to come in. And in fact, almost all of them are saying they don't. So that's the difference. Oh, OK, the the point that um, Chris is raising here kind of gets to the question I wanted to ask of you, Dave, which, um, you know, I, I heard you lay this out in great detail on Bob Murphy's show, uh, and you've laid it out a little bit here. The idea that if, you, you know, we live in this world where we have public property, we have the commons, we have government owned property, uh, and that does not mean that uh, anything goes on government property. I think we all agree. Uh, Chris seems to agree with that idea that gover you know, there's uh, no heroin in the little kids. No heroin in the little, no in the little girls school, room. Right? Uh, That's good. You know, if we're going to are... public schools at all, at least no heroin in the bathroom no, near the no, five. No peeing. You guys are uh, all more reasonable than library. some of the libertarians I was arguing with on Twitter. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, it's because we're parents. Then, so the we question, the game. <laughs> yeah, the, the, the question then becomes, you know, this question of, you know, what is reasonable and like, what is the analogy? Like you can imagine like, okay, a uh, government can run, you can imagine how a private company would run a bookstore and that's how the government might run a library. When you're talking about a nation state, uh, one way to think about it, uh, which is kind of the way I hear you talking about it, is it's run almost like this giant country club. And you've got, um, you know, the, the people who live here are members of the club and they get some sort of say, I, I guess, through this sponsorship uh, scheme of who gets to come here and, and who's not allowed in. Another way to think about it is that um, basically the federal government is just a giant security force that is there to protect our property. Uh, and so um, they don't really have much in that way of thinking about it. They don't really have much say uh, in who is allowed to come in or not beyond. Is this person a threat? 
to your person or property. Why should I think about it as a libertarian in this more expansive way instead of in that more narrow way where border control is really just about protecting our country against, you know, dangerous people? Well, I mean, again, it's it's all in how narrowly you want to even define the terms that you just used. You know, I mean, like it, from a libertarian strict point of view, you could argue the guy doing heroin in the kid's bathroom at an elementary school is like he's not doing anything violent. He's injecting something into his own body. And that's that. But we would kind of reasonably say, yeah, but this is a space for children and we can't really take the risk that you're going to be violent or something like that. I think that, mm -hmm. look, w even in the way that you kind of set up that question, I think I've kind of already succeeded in essentially what I'm trying, what I've been trying to argue with libertarians about this over the past, really over the past few years, but specifically more recently on podcasts and Twitter and stuff is that as soon as you concede that like, all right, we kind of all go, you can't have some restrictions. There can't be zero restrictions. We don't want there to be crazy, unreasonable restrictions. And now we're kind of in the middle game. Like, you know, it's the old, uh, would, would you sleep with me for $10 million? Yes. Would you sleep with me for a dollar? Who do you think I am? And it's like, we've already established who you are. Now we're ne just negotiating. Okay. So there's, uh, we're, now we're just in the process of negotiating what restrictions on, uh, on, on people are permissible on government property. And with the example of a heroin addict going into an elementary school, we've already established that, no, it's not just a person who's aggressing against other people. It could also be someone who's just going where they're not supposed to do. It could also just be something that we think might lead to disaster. But once I've got you here, I think I'm, all I'm saying is that libertarians you can abandon this idea that we're married to open borders now. It's not like what Chris was saying before. We can abandon the idea that we think heroin ought to be legal. That's a pure libertarian uh, uh, philosophical belief. But we can at this point say that we don't have to marry ourselves to this wildly unpopular idea that very clearly will result in a disaster, that there ought to be zero restrictions on immigration controls. And if I can get libertarians there for now, then I think I've, I've done my job. So to me, the likelihood of harm is really material here. Part of the reason why I'm not super down with somebody shooting up heroin in uh, you know, the bathroom of an elementary school is because that person person seems um, like high risk of doing things that are sort of untoward around children uh, in a way that all of us find to be impermissible and unreasonable and, you know, totally um, absurd to tolerate, right? As well as the fact that then you'd have a needle sort of laying around and possibly being improperly disposed of. The point being, you know, the harm, the risk factors into our assessment of the situation. One thing I think about a fair amount with immigrants that are flooding in, uh, whatever you think of the manner in which they are doing so is, well, what are the harms actually posed by them? And I think actually sort of drilling down into the data here is very useful. I mean, we have high profile cases like the murder of Lake and Riley, that nursing student who was recently killed by an illegal immigrant from Venezuela. And so, you know, there are these high profile examples of illegal immigrants, uh, occasionally committing horrifying, violent crimes. And it really bothers me that those cases are then sort of blown, um, I don't want to say blown out of proportion because any sort of individual tragedy is a huge deal. I mean, to the person sure. who is affected and to that community, but at the same time, like that is not necessarily representative of all other illegal immigrants from Venezuela. And I think it's actually important to be pretty specific and precise about what is the actual harm? What is the actual risk posed when we let people in? Part of the problem here is that we're not necessarily being very cogent of who we let in and who we do not, right? Like there's an issue where people are just getting in no matter what the Biden administration does, essentially. But I do want to go off of what you were saying, Dave, and pose this question to Chris, uh, because this has long actually been a huge pet peeve of mine. Why do you use the terminology open borders? What does open borders actually mean? Because at least for me, it doesn't feel like that term represents the thing that I believe. The thing that I believe, you know, I think is pretty reasonable, but it's basically drastically upping the number of high skilled and low skilled workers that we let in, drastically upping the number of asylum seekers. Essentially, I mean, at least in the short term, continuing to keep quotas in place, just really, really trying to make sure we uh are upping them massively and trying to sort through these backlogs so people aren't kept in this legal limbo for a super long time. To me, there's not a clear term that best describes that position. And I get frustrated by the open borders people because I think they um, 
leave a certain fear in the hearts of a lot of normies and, and, you know, even just sort of more normal libertarians, because it's like, well, wait a second, you want to let literally anybody in. And it's like, well, the thing that I am advocating for specifically is like, I don't want people dealing with 10 year long backlogs and wait times in order to have their claim process if they have an employer who wants to hire them here. So what do you make of that? Um, how do you defend the term open borders to those of us like me who are like almost on your side, but not quite? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I haven't given deep thought to the term, frankly. I've just sort of adopted it because that's that's sort of the, the going term. I mean, I don't know, scaring, I'm a philosopher, so I don't have to worry about scaring normies. Like that's that's my job. <laughs> you already uh, scare normies every single day. That's, that's, big that's right. But, but no, you, I mean, your point, your point is well taken. I, I, so I think what I would say in defense of the term is look, so I mean, open borders sometimes gets conflated with with no borders, mm -hmm. um, but which is not the case. So uh, again, to continue with the analogy that I've given, there's there's a border between West Virginia and Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania and West Virginia are, are distinct political entities. Uh, so there's this border there, but it's it's open, like it's very easy to move across it. Now here again, like you could imagine reasons for restricting that that sort of movement, but like there's a border, and it's it's like pretty much open. But if you you know if you want to replace the term with something like you know freedom of movement, you know I think that's fine, um, and I'm certainly open to to hearing suggestions for a better term because you know kidding aside, like I you know I would like to be an effective advocate for this position. Uh, so if there's something better than open borders, I'm I'm uh, all ears. Well, the thing that I'm curious about is like what exactly? So so when people show up to cross a border, what does that system look like? Yeah. So, I mean, I think we're, so, so I, I, as, I mean, I, I'm open to sort of increasing this list, but I really think there, there are two main reasons to restrict movement. And here again, they're not really uh, unique to national borders. They're just sort of general reasons why you could restrict anyone's movement is if they're sort of like wanted violent criminals. Uh, so I think a criminal background check is probably fair game. And then also maybe if there's like uh, an extremely contagious, deadly disease. Uh, and, and like, so here again, that really doesn't have anything to do with the national border because uh -oh. you know, I, no, I know there I don't want to open up this can of worms, but, uh, but so here again, it's like open borders and COVID passports for everyone. Well, <laughs> but, but in principle, in principle, like again, I don't, I, I don't want to open that. He doesn't worms. have enough vaccinations to work at the Cato Institute. That's what I just remember. Right. I, I have to work remote. <laughs> Well, sure. But so in principle, you know, uh, uh, abstracting away from the particulars of any specific case, you know, it's like this is this like, I don't know, it's imagine just to take a science fiction example, it's like a like a zombie movie or something like that. It's like, <laughs> look, you can like quarantine the zombie. Like I like I'm fine with quarantine the zombie. Uh, so like, but here again, that's not like anything to do with national borders. It's just like, look, in that case, if there's like this horrible contagious disease, and so to to circle back to your point, I think those are basically the the two things that are the two sorts of reasons why you might restrict a person's access. Can I can well, I ask you, Chris? You possibly... Can I just ask Chris a quick question? Because you you've said several times that like um if there's someone who's like wanted for a crime or something like that, and I I get your point there. Um, I do think that would require an apparatus where people aren't just flooding in. You have to check people in order to know um but wh why just wanted for a crime what if uh someone's just got it say they've they've served their time they're not wanted anymore but they've they've been convicted of rape three times and stabbed people five times and they've served their time they're done but they just have a vicious violent criminal record and nobody in this country has invited them in they just show up to our country and go i'd like to come in should we turn them away or let them in well, so so I, I take it that what you're getting at is say, well, in that case, it actually seems like even though the person has saved their time or, or served their time, they're like a legitimate risk uh, to inhabitants of a country. So that so that's like the principle. It's not it's not uh, being a wanted criminal in particular, but you could say something like if this person has a sufficiently high probability of harming people in their personal property, et cetera, and we could you know fill in the details of that. Okay, no, but I'm just uh, so I, like I really just ask like, because it does. It, it does kind of walk back the standard just one more layer. So it's not just if they're wanted for a crime, but now it's if there's a probability that maybe they could be a problem uh, in the country, they can be excluded. So I mean, again, I just I would say I don't I'm, I don't I don't think that's open borders anymore. Once you well, get to other, that point, it might be I, minimal restrictions, but it's not exactly a lack. It's well, it's not an absence of the, restrictions. The other thing that comes to mind is this question of like, I think we would probably all here agree that 
authorities restricted freedom of movement quite aggressively during over the course of the COVID-19 pandemic um, in a manner that I felt, um, I felt as though, and I was very clear about this in my writing and TV hits, that the threat posed by that specific virus in no way um, rose to the level um, of requiring this type of really obscene uh, and horrifying government response. And so I've been left with this sense of like, okay, like I don't want massive polio epidemics, but like I don't really particularly trust any sort of government authorities to know what that level is, the appropriate, like like if they overreacted to the degree that they did with COVID-19, who is to say that they would actually be able to um, sufficiently contain diseases and, and viral threats given that they have a horrifying track record of doing a really bad job with that. How do you, what do you make of that, Chris? Like what would happen, like, are you, like what would happen in, if there were sort of a, a COVID round two type case? I mean, I, I think that's friendly to my position, isn't it? So yeah. if the idea is, you, you, yeah. if you're worried that if, so I take it the worry is something like if you give the state an inch, it'll take a mile and we don't want it to take a mile. Yeah. I'm with you. Like I'm with you. But but so here again, so we might distinguish. But how between... do we trust them to decide what a reasonable contagion is that necessitates the closing of borders or the restricting of the flow of people? Because they already sort of demonstrated how horrible they are at actually making that call. So So here's what I would say. If you don't trust them to do that, then mm -hmm. there's no particular reason reason to trust them to screen out immigration for any other reason. And yeah, so I that think brings to, that so, brings to my mind, you know, the comment that we played from Dave at the beginning about bring the troops home and put them on the border. It's just like it. it a really ramped up um, immigration enforcement necessitates a uh, you know, a militarized border. It necessitates the growth of the and empowerment of the security state in the same way that we saw the so-called biosecurity state, you know, rise to power during the COVID pandemic. If we suddenly have a, you know, reaction to uh, the migrant quote unquote crisis, then you end up with the same thing. You're feeding yeah. state power. Is that a concern that lingers in your mind, Dave? Oh, yeah, 100 um, percent. But, you know, like what I snuck in there is take the entire military. And so I ended the empire in one fell swoop. So that was uh, I like part you of did the, it. You made it look so easy. Yeah. There's so, you know, so it's not exactly, got a lot of toys that they uh, developed over there. They're no, going to be not, bringing it home might, and use on us now. Well, the I, I get your point. Here, let's be real. Look, I did uh, say on Bob Murphy's podcast that like, yeah, look, if I had my way, they'd also be discharged and then like rehired as border uh, security or something like that. But yes, I mean, it wouldn't be necessarily an increase in the size of or, or it factually wouldn't be an increase in the size of government. It would be uh, the same, but they would all be concentrated here. And look, I mean, there's no question about I'm, this. I'm kind of less worried about like the size and more like where are the guns pointed? Uh, yeah, I know you're more comfortable with them pointed at Iraqi children than pointed at Americans. I'm not uh, comfortable Americans. with either, but no, I understand. Uh, no, listen, I'm not even like, I don't even say that in a judgmental way. I get it. It's like, yeah, it's scarier when it comes home than when it's being done abroad. But at the same time, I don't, I don't think, think it's any more or less. I don't think that's Zach's point though, because Zach is a pretty consistent anti-war voice. No, no, no. I'm just, I'm, okay. I'm just saying yeah, that he's I, saying he's concerned about the, the yeah, military being I, over here but then uh, if you're an anti-war voice then okay but you also get them not being over there at the same point no look there's no question and i think this is something for every uh libertarian who is is not in support of open borders we should all keep very much in the front of our minds that look if you ask the government to do anything it's a guarantee they're going to mess it up and it's a guarantee yeah. that rights are going to be violated in the process at the same time we wouldn't necessarily conclude even and caps like myself wouldn't conclude that under current circumstances government should stop uh prosecuting murder but yeah. by the way the same thing applies to that there's going to be people falsely accused of murder there's going to be people who fit an identity and then got shot when they were fleeing the scene of something even though it was the wrong guy we see these problems all the time and so but in addition to like kind of everything we're talking about in this conversation there probably is a lot of of agreement between all four of us on government policies that could make the situation much much better and the one at the absolute top of the list to me is to end the war on drugs man the war on drugs has so much to do with so much of the problems that are coming over uh the border and, so yes. much of the violence um so much of the the fentanyl that's being shipped over the only reason why there's even a market for it is because it's it's uh, all the drugs are are kept in the black market and the hundred thousand 
uh, ODs plus debts a year. It's all because people are getting cocaine and Percocet on the black market and they don't realize there's fentanyl in it and they're killing themselves. And so, and, um, and of course, also, this is the, um, this is the funding mechanism for all of the violent gangs. And so I think you would cut down on the violence and cut down on, on a lot of these problems by ending the war on drugs, ending intervention in Central and South America. Um, I, I'd imagine all four of us agree on that stuff. But to your point, I agree with you. Anytime the government does anything, it's uh, there's, there's going to be a lot of problems. I just think that as somebody who's an ANCAP, the idea of abolishing government borders, or as Chris said, not abolishing government borders, but abolishing the the control over them to a large degree would probably be the absolute last thing that would be abolished in, in as far as governments go. Um, that's the most fundamental thing in, in some senses that governments do is that's how you know where they are and what geographic territory they have control over. And there's got to be some type of order of operation to that. There are a bunch of other marginal solutions uh, in the vein of what you were talking about, Dave. Like, for example, you know, I think 10xing the quota for H-1B visas would probably be a relatively uncontroversial policy proposal, in part because those people are high skilled workers and um you know, I would imagine most frequently could find employers who are willing to hire them. I mean, I'm specifically talking about H-1B visas. Um you know, and yeah. and there's this. I'm just question. pulling up the uh, the visas issued from 2014 yeah, through because we really don't um, issue that many flat. of them, all things considered, compared to the size of the population as a whole. But I think H-1B visa holders are, in particular, an interesting category, and there are a few other that fall into this category. Um, I mean, they're just not really likely to rely on welfare, um, and I also think that there's some interesting solutions. Uh, offered by folks like Brian Kaplan, which are basically like, hey, what would happen if we let a whole bunch of people in, but really capped their access to welfare to a really significant degree? And of course, that doesn't fully negate the problems that you raised with emergency room usage and public school usage that you brought up earlier, Dave. But it would, I think, play a pretty significant role. Like, like my, my point being, we could do an awful lot by simply letting in immigrants who we deem most likely to be able to really take care of them themselves and have a decent shot, shot of not being these charges of the state and not being sort of leeches yeah. on the welfare state in the future. And like, that's sort of where I wish more of the conversation would sometimes focus. Of course, a lot of the people who are currently flooding the border are not those very same people. Right. And right. So that's right. And that's, but that's, there, there's a lot of overlap there to the point of a uh, Hoppe's invitation sponsorship yeah. uh, system is that you're going to incentivize people now to essentially have to make a bet that this person isn't going to be someone who, who, you know, ends up on welfare. This isn't going to be a violent criminal. And then you at least get a, you, you get a different type of person and the different people who are coming for different reasons. And yeah. that's not what we're yeah. getting right now. Um, well, so I want to, you know, I want to raise the question. Well, I want to open hold on, up the question. Well, Liz, well, well, Liz, hold on just a second, just because we're, we're, since we're talking about the welfare uh, issue now, I think we should talk a little bit okay. about, you know, the actual empirical data around that. Um, and I know that you've criticized some of these Cato studies, Dave, but um, this is one of, you can, you're free to criticize this one as well as you want. This is one of uh, the recent ones, the fiscal impact of immigration in the United States, I believe published last year uh, by three Cato uh, economists. And um, basically what they find is, uh, this is one of the figures, each of these lines there, the dark line is the first, is first generation immigrants. The light gray is second generation. The orange is third generation um, over their lifetime. Um, this red line, uh, when they're below the red line, basically they're kind of taking more government benefits. And when they're above the red line, they're contributing more in, you know, tax receipts than they are taking. Uh, I'm and sorry. And the, the, um, the bottom axis there, is that, are those, the those are their ages. I'm sorry. I mean, Those are their ages. Okay. Yes. So, over, so, so the predictable pattern here is when you're young, using K through 12 school, and don't have a job, you are a net, you know, uh, consumer. And then once you start to hit working age, you become a net uh, contributor. And then when you retire, you become a net uh, consumer again. Um, and uh, this is right, and this the is. Ratio. I'm sorry. I, I just I haven't yeah. looked at this study before. Is this this is measuring immigrants of the past, or is this a projection for the future? This is immigrants of the past. We're, we'll okay. get to um, the future in a second. Um, this is uh, drawing from uh, Census Bureau data, um, and uh, this. 
here is ratio of tax receipts to outlays. Uh, so it's showing, again, the red line, anything underneath the red line, basically you're kind of like a net, uh, you're not a net contributor. Uh, so back, this is over time. The, the this, this is not by age. This is like back in the 90s, you can see first generation immigrants tended to be net contributors that went a little negative and then kind of got to like neutral by 2017, 2018. Um, second and third generation kind of stay below the red line. So that data is looking good for Dave, um, his case. Uh, but then another thing Cato did here was they added in capital income um, as a, uh, a fiscal impact. So basically, you know, once, uh, immigrants come to work here, they start working for companies and they start creating value for the companies. And so you also capture that in tax revenues. And so they added that in. And when they did that, they found that immigrants, particularly more recent immigrants, uh, after, uh, for particularly more recent immigrants, um, are more productive uh, economically, um, uh, even than the native population. Um, and the reason uh, that Cato concludes that the, the most recent immigrants are particularly productive, uh, two reasons. One, the demographics, they tend to be closer to working age when they're coming in. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, there's been some kind of tightening of welfare on the federal, state and local levels uh, by recent, I mean, the past five years. Uh, and this one, uh, Dave, is projecting forward. Uh, so, um, that's like their, so, uh, like my, my conclusion just from looking at the Cato studies and some of the other stuff is basically, uh, immigrants are probably a net contributor at worst neutral and almost certainly not any more of a, you know, suck on the welfare teeth than the native born. Um, so if, first of all, do you, do you, agree that that's more or less the case? And if so, why would that justify, um, why would that justify immigration restrictions if, you know, every new baby born is kind of in the same situation as an immigrant? Well, okay. So it, it, let me say it like this. Number one, I would say that I just take with a grain of salt any uh, model-based projections. They're just It's the worst type of science across the board in every single scientific field, whether it's climate science or whether it was the projections that Sweden's going to have 100,000 COVID deaths by summer. It's, all, it's just very, very difficult to account for every single variable. Um, scientists and intellectuals often... Um, think they are much better at predicting the future than they are. And there's there's just way too many different variables to ever really say this stuff with any certainty. So I, in, as far as the projections into the future, I just take that with a grain of salt. As far as okay. the stuff from the past, I'm not going to dispute the numbers. I, I don't exactly know. I've looked into a few Cato studies where I've seen some pretty glaring holes in them. I haven't looked into this one. So I, I'd have to read the whole thing to give you like a my this opinion about it. This will be linked. I also think that Look, there's a little bit of a, this kind of libertarian catch-22 that immigrants find themselves in through no fault of their own. But you're either in a situation where, and this is just because this is the nature of government, right, is that you're either in a situation where you're taking government services, which are provided by the taxpayer, in which case the taxpayer is kind of getting ripped off if they're forced to, to, um, to fund you when they don't want to, or you're in a situation where you're putting money back, you're paying money in taxes which isn't really a solution for libertarians either because you're just kind of funding the apparatus who we don't really like very much. And it's not as if they're then returning that money to the taxpayers who subsidized you in those early years. They're just spending it on some other project to make their own cronies uh, wealthy. Yeah. Now, there is a point to what you're saying that they're being productive. If they have a job, they're contributing to the economy. The stuff outside of the state, I think, is what libertarians would probably appreciate. But I think that, look, the question becomes, if you think about it in real life, again, you have a situation where the domestic population has been taxed for generations to build infrastructure all around them, whether it's roads and firehouses and hospitals and schools and, uh, you know, police forces and all of these things. And the immigrant who comes in day one gets access to all of those things. 
You get access to all of the things that the taxpayer has been forced to pay for. And my point is just that, that from the libertarian point of view, the people who have been forced to pay for that all along ought to have a say as to whether or not they want to share what they were forced at the point of the threat of violence to fund rather than just somebody who wasn't a part of that. Now, if you want to say that also applies to new babies who are born in America, I mean, sure, that's that's true for some of them, probably not our kids, but that's true for some kids who are going to be like, you know, um, who are going to be reliant on the system. The difference is there's just no way to parse that out within our society, whereas it's very clear that people not coming from our country were not a part of the domestic population. I mean, there there, there would be a way to to parse it out to see who, you know, uh, over the average lifetime is, uh, is the average American, do they contribute more or take more as a taxpayer? Um, I guess my question to simplify it is like, do you, have you seen evidence that leads you to believe that immigrants uh, you know, take more welfare than the native born over a lifetime. Oh, I mean, I think that if you, uh, so un like currently what's going on is all of the immigrants who are coming here are immediately taking a bunch of, uh, government assistance. And that's true all throughout the country. Um, uh, what, what will happen over their lifetime? I, I don't know. I don't, I, but if I they don't come, think I mean, if they, the, the, the data I was showing before shows that if they come around working age, they tend to contribute. A no, lot it shows that. No, it shows that that's what's happened in the past. And yes. that does not necessarily mean that that's what's going to happen in the future. Do you think that the okay. current composition of immigrant, like, do you think that there's something about the current composition of immigrants that would lead to this historic trend changing? Well, I mean, it depends on how far we're going back, but yeah, there I are mean, some, I mean, you know, more like immigrants who came here in the eighties and nineties, not, you know, there's no sure. reason to argue about the immigrants who came over a hundred years ago when the U S had something more akin to an open border state. Well, right. And also more akin to a limited constrained constitutional yeah. Republic and didn't have a welfare state and things like that. So yes, I do think that when you have a giant welfare state, you do attract a different type of person. Um, now I'm not saying that's true for 100% of the people and so probably not even the majority of them, but that, yes, you, you get, this is basic libertarian economics that if yeah. you have a welfare state, you're going to get more people than you otherwise would have gotten to come here. Um, I also do think that we are in, we live in a drastically under a drastically different government and in a drastically different culture than we lived in the 1980s. And as someone who's old enough yeah. to remember uh, parts of the 1980s, I do not think it can be overstated how profoundly you different a country born we're in, in the today. 1980s, Dave. Yes. How much do you actually remember? Oh, I remember. I mean, I was born in 83. I remember, right. you know, I, I got early memories. I, I, I got memories from like 86. I'm, I uh, think you're trying to play the village elder card. And I'm like, I know exactly how old both you and Zach are. Chris is the mystery box over there. I'm older. No, but. <laughs> 82. Oh, he's got but, me. Beat. Um, All right, there you go. But, no, but Dave, I, I do feel, Dave, I do feel like you're sidestepping the question a little bit. And I do think it's a question well, that is served by going in, you know, going towards specifics. Like, I mean, we have pretty good data that indicates that generally speaking, immigrants of the recent past are not these leeches on the welfare state. They are net contributors. Is there something about the people who are flooding the border today um, that indicates that that won't be true any longer? I, I'm not saying there's something about the people. I'm saying that I think there's something about our culture that indicates that that may not be mm -hmm. true anymore. And we did not have this kind of like intense grievance based um, uh, left wing culture in, in America in the 1980s. And we yeah. did not have this intense kind of populist uh, right wing culture in America. And there was, look, I know it's not the 19, uh, or I know it's not, it wasn't the 1920s, but even in the 1980s, there was much more of like, uh, this kind of pressure to assimilate it, it, we were much more of a pro American, uh, culture. And there was, and we don't have that at all anymore. And in fact, what's happening now, as you can see over the last few years with the, the waves of, of immigration is that you essentially have the progressives lining up um, to offer as much free stuff and to tell the people coming in that they are the victims of a white supremacist society already and how awful our culture is. But and then you they, have the, but hold on, but, but like, do the people who are coming in, sorry to interrupt, but I mean, do the people who are coming in 
by and large actually believe it. I mean, I feel like it's not as if they're like listening to the retarded, excuse my French, Brooklyn hipsters and just swallowing that narrative wholesale. No, no, no. I'm not saying Brooklyn hipsters. I'm saying like Nancy Pelosi and people like that. And like, still, like, like, do we have any evidence that indicates that they're going to be those types of Americans versus people who, I mean, we have a ton of good data that indicates really high levels of religiosity among recent immigrants, really high levels of Oh, they're religious. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not denying they're not religious. I mean, I don't know exactly what you're asking. High patriotism too. I'm saying that they're, it's not as if they're just being fed this narrative of like America is a declining land and really they should just engage in this vicious cycle of grievance mongering. No, 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 but, I'm not, but that's that not what I'm saying. I'm okay, not saying okay. that they're b- believing saying. that America is this, uh, is a, a fallen land or something like okay. that. What I'm, what I'm saying is, and look, I mean, I don't know if there's, if there's opinion polls amongst illegal immigrants, which I don't think exists or opinion polls amongst legal immigrants or whatever, that that might exist. Um, that does exist, but, yeah. But yeah, but there are certainly there's you can look at um, anecdotal evidence of people making videos about how to squat in people's homes. You could certainly look at there were there were protests outside of the immigration uh, facilities in New York City when they had to move them for a couple of days out to the boroughs because they were outraged that they weren't going to continue getting the free housing that they had gotten in New York City and we're only going to get free housing out in Queens. So I don't know exactly. Well, hold on. Let me just, I don't know exactly how pervasive that is amongst these guys, but yes, there certainly is some evidence that this, the progressive like stuff works. That's why it's taken over the entire country. When you hand people poor stuff and then start giving them a narrative, it has some effect. And so, yeah, I'm I'm certainly concerned about that. Well, so I want you to, I, I don't want to interrupt and I want you to flesh it out a little bit better. I mean, to steel man, like the specific example that you're citing, I remember it because I'm a Queens resident, uh, as you know, and part of the reason some of the illegal immigrants were frustrated about being moved from shelters in Manhattan to shelters like near where I live in Rockaway, like Floyd Bennett Field, which is a massive housing facility for immigrants, um, for illegal immigrants, um, Part of the reason they were pissed off about this is because now this means they have to ride the bus for like an hour in order to receive the social services that they had thought they were going to get or in order for their children to continue going to the schools that they had been assigned or in order to wait in lines to get their New York State IDs, right? Like it wasn't just this like holding out the hands being like, oh, but my free stuff type mentality. Even what you just described is my free stuff. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not saying that I. So you're saying they have to get. They have to no. get on a bus to go get their handouts, or they have to switch their co- their kid no. into the free school that they get their kid into. I mean, no, I, I don't no, know. no, that's not no. Be like, I, I, I want to. I want to legitimately understand what you're saying, and I also want you to legitimately understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that I'm on board with this whole thing, but to some degree, it does kind of make sense if you're going from being on, you know, First Ave and 14th. Uh, and you know, you know that the place where you need to get your New York state ID in order to then be able to apply for work authorization, you know, that the place where you need to apply for that ID is three blocks away. And now you're being transported to Floyd Bennett field out in Queens. And so it's going to take you an hour and a half to do that commute to wait in line. I mean, you can understand why they would be confused and frustrated by that, especially because they're totally unfamiliar with the geography of New York city. It's I mean, not this is right. Different yeah, look, than what they envision. I- I understand your point, and certainly I could understand where they'd be confused. And look, none of this is like central to my arguments against open yeah. borders or anything like that. But I would also say that, like, I don't know. I've I've grown up like I had to. It took me so long. It took me probably until the last few years that I could afford to live in like, like where I wanted to live in New York City, like be in like Manhattan rather than be in one of the other boroughs. And it's not just that they're confused or they're upset. It was the fact that they were protesting, like as if there is something here that's owed to them that does kind of indicate to me like, yeah, there does seem to be a different character of this generation of immigrants than the people pouring in in 1870, who it was kind of like, yeah, you're going to live like shit and you're not going to complain about it at all. And you're going to do that in the hopes that if you grind your fingers to the bones, maybe your kids will grow up here and have a better life. There does seem to be some indication to me that that's different. By the way, I think that's different across the board throughout our entire culture, and I think it's not so great. But again, none of this is really central to my my argument. We agree. I I, the the example just stuck out to me and worth clarifying because I remember a lot of hay being made out of it and feeling as though some parts of it were kind of cherry picked and it was turned into this narrative that was perhaps not totally representative of what was actually going on. But I totally agree. Any sort of entitlement versus industriousness. Like I want industrious 
immigrants to come to this country. Listen, I don't if want they were out to voters, right? And I think you and I are totally yes, on the same page. One hundred percent. Look, if the, I would have a lot more sympathy if they were outside saying, "Give us permission to work." All I want to do is go get a job, and there are restrictions in their ways to going and getting jobs. So I, I would have, but at the, same by the federal time, government, the real I, villain look, in all of this, right? Well, like, yes, but I, look, I grew up in that. Park Slope, Brooklyn. I am probably the only member of my friend group who grew up there who could buy a house in Park Slope, Brooklyn, right now if I wanted to. They have all been priced out. Like all of them have been priced out. Now a lot of that's because of government policies that led to housing prices going nuts, and a lot of different stuff. We probably all agree on, but. There is something that does kind of rub me the wrong way about people who just got here to this country protesting that they have to commute in from Queens rather than uh, rather than say, when, by the way, they're given Metro cards by the taxpayers. And so yeah. those same people, my same friends who can't afford to live where they grew up are working their asses off and paying the taxes that pay for all the stuff that these people are getting. And they're protesting that they got to go out to Queens. I will say that that does rub me the wrong way. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally yeah. get what you're saying. I do think there, again, it is tough because especially like it was funny because Zach mentioned, quote unquote, you know, the migrant crisis earlier. And at least to me as a New York City resident, I very much do feel like it is a crisis right now because there is this sense that New York had this consent decree, the right to shelter law in place that I think new New York authorities seemingly sort of unthinkingly put into place, just expecting uh, nobody to ever need to make good on it. But in fact, word got out, whether through, I mean, there's some evidence that it's through like social media um, that a lot of newcomers have found out about this. Uh, but essentially now we have this huge issue where New York is running out of money and Eric Adams is basically saying, nope, turn around, don't come here. Because New York, I think, thought that this would go a lot better than it actually has gone. And of course it's not going well. When you have a massive number of immigrants coming into a city that only has so much ability to accommodate that, and they end up being this huge drain on social services, it creates a really, really big problem. And it's kind of wild watching Adams and a bunch of progressive New Yorkers realizing, actually, the bill always comes due. Uh, and I'm very curious about whether there will be a political backlash among New Yorkers who basically say, hey, this isn't something that we really consented to. Well, it's I would literally called a consent decree. And yet a lot of people feel like I did not consent to this. Can I just say very quickly um, that uh, number one, it's been amazing watching every progressive Democrat uh, magically transformed into a Trumpian from 2016 has <laughs> really been something that, that's pretty great without them acknowledging it or addressing it that like, oh, yeah, we were demonizing this guy so hard. And now we're saying the same things he was. And the other thing I would just say is like a little bit of a thought experiment. If you see how crazy the situation is right now and how crazy the rhetoric and how crazy the drain is, just imagine if under current circumstances right now, we just said the borders are open. And this was announced. There are zero restrictions going forward. What the next year in the United States of America would look like. And my uh, my best guess would be that if you think Trump is a right wing populist, we'd be about a year away from living under a real deal right wing dictator. All right, OK, let me uh, pick up on that idea, Dave, to bring, to put a last question to Chris. And then I'll let you guys, you know, ask each other one last question, then wrap up. Um, this, uh, although let me mention one thing about me putting a uh, crisis in square, scare I'm quotes. On you, Zach. Uh, I'm I, sorry. you know, I'm not uh, downplaying the idea that um, there's a lot of problems that are being caused by the government's inability to uh, cope with all the migrants that are coming to the border in the cities. Um, I just wanted to underline the idea that uh, the government, like that, uh, the state uh, benefits from crises, uh, real or imagined or exaggerated, uh, and often takes that opportunity to grow as we saw in recent years. But uh, I want to pick, on, uh, pick up on Dave's point um, about the, the difficulty of absorbing a large uh, influx uh, and like what would happen if there was, if we just decided, okay, we're going to have open borders. Um, Liz and I were looking at some of the Gallup polling, they ask migrants worldwide all the time, how, you know, if you could, if you could uh, migrate, if you could leave your home country, would you do it? And in 2021, a peak of nearly 900 million worldwide said that they would migrate. Uh, if you dig into that, about 18% of them say that they would choose the United States as their top destination uh, if you do that math, it's about 162 million um, in a scenario where the U.S. is the only country that's opening its borders. You could imagine that number might be even higher. Um, 
you know, what do you say to people, Chris, who are concerned uh, that a huge, you know, almost half the U.S. population coming from around the world here would change the culture, change the economics, and just kind of uh, sow the seeds for the uh, kind of really scary backlash that that Dave is, uh, you know, raising there. Yeah. So, so actually, if if I could offer a, a thought on sort of the previous discussion, I think it's so. I mean, yeah. I, I think uh, I, it is the case that most immigrants tend to be net contributors, and simply because they consume sort of state funded benefits at one point in time doesn't mean that they will continue to be a, a net consumer over time. So, like just in my own case, like I presume I was a net consumer for the first eighteen years of my life until I entered the labor market and then I became a net contributor. So it's it's very plausible to me that, you know, immigrants who come here get on their feet, perhaps thanks in part to state funded benefits, will be net contributors over the, the course of their lifetime. But I, but, but I can set that aside. Um, on the point about, you know, having uh, hundreds of millions of, of immigrants coming in, I mean, one thing is uh, expressing a desire to immigrate doesn't necessarily translate into action and especially not immediate action. <laughs> but to to not dodge the question, I mean, you know, I don't know. I would say, uh, what if we institutionalized any sort of radical libertarian proposal tomorrow? So if somebody said we can put heroin on the shelves of Walgreens tomorrow, that would change the culture pretty rapidly. Or what if we said, uh, you know, we we do away with the income tax tomorrow? that would have a lot of radical consequences as well. And so you could just so go on down the line. And so I would just sort of make a symmetry point here. Like I could see it go in one, go in one of two ways. One is just, I am a purist libertarian and I want heroin on the shelves of Walgreens tomorrow. I want to, this is like the, the libertarian button, I think. Like, could you press the libertarian button and make it a, a libertarian society tomorrow? Do you press the button, you put the heroin, you know, in, in the pharmacies, you get rid of the income tax, you privatize everything overnight. You might say, I'm a purist and I would do that. Uh, you know, let just justice be done, though, though the heavens may fall. I'd press and it. if that's your view, I say, all right, cool. Then what, don't don't worry about immigration. Like it's it's one in the same. Like it's it's just part part of this uh, this package of radical libertarian views. But then you might say, eh, I'm a little more conservative than that. Like maybe we you know we start decriminalizing some stuff and you know so and like reduce the income tax over time because you know we have good Hayekian reasons to not have radical change overnight. I say that that sounds reasonable to me. In which case you say, all right, uh, you know, a, a, as per sort of Liz's suggestion, maybe we just sort of ratchet up the number of immigrants uh, permitted in each year and, and see how it goes. But so here again, like I don't think there's a special problem with immigration. Like this is a problem with any sort of libertarian position. Like if you do it all overnight, it's going to have a lot of change really quickly. And if you're fine with that, you should be fine with that in the case of immigration. If you're not fine with that in the case of drugs and taxes and everything else, then I say, okay, like, fair enough. I, I can see the point in that. But then here again, there's no special problem with I, I do, But there is. There is a special problem. And I, I laid this out earlier, and I don't think it's been addressed. Look, I would unquestionably press the button to legalize heroin or to abolish the income tax, because you're right, it would be a drastic change. But the drastic change would be a radical reduction in violent crime, a radical reduction in uh, OD deaths, if you're talking about drugs. And my God, I mean, the radical change from abolishing the income tax would be to make this country enormously more productive, incentivize work. Incent I mean, like I just know like myself, like I, I would hire three more people if the income taxes were reduced, the amount of jobs that would be created, it would be like this huge boon to the economy and it would be starving the most evil parasitical organization, which is Earth. But the difference with the immigration system, well, number one, I would argue it would be a disaster, an, an epic disaster if we open the borders tomorrow. But it's also that, look, you have this dynamic where there are uninvited people coming here. They have no right to be here. There is no natural right that says if a caravan of 100,000 people who are uninvited come here, they just get to enter property that isn't theirs. And so why, if we were just pushing the button, like say we were just pushing a button to uh, legalize heroin, or we were just pushing a button to uh, repeal the income tax, those are, if we were just pushing a button to open the borders, what you're gonna have is millions of people who were not invited here flooding the country. Why is that a libertarian outcome? What, hey. what natural? right do they have to come play here? it out play it out for us why would opening the borders tomorrow be a disaster what would that look like well i mean 
okay, we've had the those record highs under Joe Biden. And what so far do you think that looks like? I mean, okay, you've got all the stuff you were just describing in New York City. Um, p- kids who are in uh, public schools having to make sacrifices. You've had uh, the social safety nets being drained. And by the way, the response to that is not going to be, therefore, we abolish the social safety net. The response to that is going to be, therefore, we have to increase the social safety net. And you have Donald Trump, if he's not removed by these uh, criminal charges, cruising on his way to re-election. Is that the results anyone likes? Open the borders, you're going to get something like that times 10. It's going to be, I mean, the the re, the reactions that we're going to get from this are going to be nothing even moving us close to a libertarian direction. In fact, I think it would probably move us much, much further from a free society. Chris, do you agree with that idea of what would happen if we did this tomorrow? Uh, if we did it tomorrow? I mean, I don't know. So our I- vision to offer. Like if that's, that's Dave's vision for what, you know, March 27th looks like. Uh, so what's your I, vision? I'm- I am more skeptical, I suppose, than than Dave is about pressing the libertarian button. So, like, I I like privatizing not everything, but I like privatizing most things. Uh, I like getting rid of the income tax. Uh, I like legalizing drugs. I like all those those ideas. That doesn't mean if we did it overnight, the consequences would be good tomorrow. Uh, I, I, I'm Hayekian enough to think that gradual change is probably the best. Uh, and so, like, it's, it is very hard to predict what's going to happen as a result of any of those radical changes. Here again, I don't think there's a special problem with immigration. Um, and so I probably wouldn't press the libertarian button for, for any of those things. Uh, and it, like, it's just not obvious to me that, say, if we put heroin on the shelves of Walgreens tomorrow with, you know, other things in place, perhaps. So if that's the if that's what we're imagining, say, keep everything else in place, but we open up the borders. I could very much imagine an increased fiscal burden resulting from an increase in the number of heroin users, for example. Okay, but um, let me ask, uh, you know, uh, I guess, you know, Dave kind of laid out his dystopian vision of a a future with much freer immigration. Um, Could you lay out your positive vision? Like what, like, it doesn't have to be open borders tomorrow, but let's say we start letting just a lot more peaceful, nonviolent people come here. What do you see as the future for America? I mean, I, I see it as in many ways the same as the past. Like this is, uh, you know, not to, to get all sentimental about it, but I think this is a big part of what has made America great is like people can come here from anywhere in the world. They can, they can work here. They can earn far more money. They contribute to economic growth. They contribute to cultural diversity, all these sorts of things. And so like I, I think it has worked extremely well so far. Uh, having not completely open borders, but very open borders. I think our culture, I think our economy is stronger as a result of immigration. Uh, And I I don't see any particular reason to think that that's going to change. I would certainly agree that um, certainly in the time period in America, when we didn't have a welfare state or a central bank or an income tax, and we were an industrializing society, that I think the policy of um, very loose immigration worked out very well. So I do agree with you on that. I just think we have very, a lot of fundamental differences today. I, I want, want to, to give, give you guys. The, oh yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I just wanted to give you guys um, the opportunity to ask each other very briefly. What's like so? What's like one short question that you have for your opponent here um, that you just really want to hear with open ears their answer to? Picture this as a sort of couples therapy session where Zach and I are your therapist. Uh, Dave, you go first. What question do you have for Chris? Um, well, look, I would just, I, I would kind of ask the question that I was asking before. I'd say if there's somebody uh, who is coming into America who was not invited, um, do they have a natural right to come into a country? In other words, if, if Japan doesn't want me to come there tomorrow, do I have a natural right to go to Japan if I'm not invited by anyone? So I think it depends on the particular. So I think you, you have a, ni- a natural right to, you know, use somebody's private property if they give you permission. They have You have a natural right to work at a job if somebody's willing to hire you. You have a natural right to associate with people. But I'm saying if that, none of that's happened. I'm saying if nobody's given me permission, nobody's hired me, nothing. I just want to come in. I'm here and I want to come in. Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is yes, for the same reason that somebody can come into West Virginia from Pennsylvania, even if they're not invited by West Virginians. So, I, I, I mean, I think a lot of the, the disagreement comes about as a result of the, this sort of public property issue. 
And yeah. so my, like my, my concern is like having double standards. So again, like somebody can come in from one state to another and they can start uh, consuming tax funded services in that state. They can start changing the culture of that state. They, they don't have to be invited. Uh, but I, like I think here again, it would be very unlibertarian to say that we can't have people moving across state borders for these sorts of reasons. And so I don't think we should have restrictions on people moving across national borders for those reasons. Chris, do you have a question that you want to pose to Dave? I don't know. Am I as bad as a communist? <laughs> well, no, because you didn't say you backed off of wanting open borders tomorrow. So that's it. You're better than a, <laughs> better than a communist. We'll get him in five like years. By the way, I, I follow you on Twitter now. You got a lot of great memes making fun of the communists, by the way. I enjoy well, them. Uh, I, that's what I'm not. Somebody introduced me. Zach, did you introduce me as a meme maker? This is my legacy. Yeah. I don't know if that's <laughs> a good thing. Is my I, like, I, I like philosopher Wait. slash meme maker is a good, uh, that's a good deal. Chris, wasn't I part page. of the origin story of why you started making the memes? Yes. So, uh, <laughs> no, that's right. So, I remember that's I was the greatest good I've done outside of birthing my son. The second greatest no, thing I've ever done was to it's a bad. It's doing a bad. Because now I'm making all these memes. But no, it is because I remember <laughs> I was a meme skeptic. And like, I like I liked that memes, I, I remember your phrase was like, democratizes knowledge or something like that. And I was like, all right, she's got a point. I think so, I, I conveyed, uh, I, I acted as though memes have far too much power in this world. But like, then again, maybe they do, right? Like maybe, they might, they might have more, they probably have more power than they should, which is not to say they have a lot, but yeah. All right. Let me give you each uh, an opportunity for a final closing statement. Uh, Dave went first. So I guess that means Chris will go last. So Dave, do you have a final, um, you know, few minutes, uh, you know, up to five minutes, sure. max uh, closing statement. Sure, sure. And I'm, I'm actually pressed for time. So I'll try my best to uh, not go long. I would just I, I would say that um, what what I said earlier in the conversation about I've, I think feel like I've already at least kind of got the concessions that like we all grant that there can be some restrictions on on public property. And I, I think that's something that I, I'd like libertarians to at least accept. So I'm very happy with that. Thanks, all you guys uh, for doing this. I've really enjoyed it. I would just say, OK, very, uh, very briefly. If uh, let's say I was like a trained killer, OK, like I'm a Navy SEAL or something like that. And I got a bunch of weapons in my house and I got an AK-47 loaded, ready to go in my hands. And an unarmed guy breaks into my house and I, uh, I watch him do it. And then he goes and like just uh, assaults my family and I watch him do it. And he takes all my stuff and I watch him do it and, I, and he leaves. I just watch the whole thing. I think it could kind of be deduced from that that I allowed that to happen because I am a trained killer with a weapon who very easily could have protected my family. And I chose not to similarly, when you see this, like uh, this struggle of Joe Biden saying, Hey, we really want border security and we're really trying to do it. And uh, the Democrats want it and the Republicans want it, but they just can't get it together. When you have this government of savage killers who literally are the most powerful organization in the history of the world that can touch a wedding in Yemen if they think there's a guy suspected there who they don't like and blow the whole thing up. I would say similarly, they are allowing this to happen. And they're allowing this to happen for a reason. And I think it's related. And I'm not saying like what the whatever the cartoonish, like great replacement theory thing is. I mean, it's, I'm not saying it's anything like that. I don't think it's like to replace white people. I don't think that has is really even part of the equation. I think that we're living in a crumbling empire. The people have in a major way, particularly in the heels of COVID, woken up to the corruption of government. And much like the Russians wanted to flood ethnic Russians into their satellite countries to break up their kind of national unity. I think that's kind of what's going on here. And it's not a coincidence that the people who the biggest government proponents amongst us are the ones who have been kind of orchestrating this policy. I don't think that libertarians should handcuff ourselves and say that we must actually go along with this plan. And we can't actually say that what the overwhelming majority of property owners in this country who wish for this to stop, that they don't have a right to do that. And specifically in areas like Texas, where private uh, property owners are asking the government to fulfill their one legitimate function of protecting their property. I think libertarians should be outspoken supporters of that and supporters of what the government in Texas is doing there, putting up that fence. Um, I would just say the, and, and this will be my final thought that what I think this all comes down to is, as Chris agreed, is the issue of government property and that 
when government does something, when government takes control of something, there are other things that government is then obligated to do. Um, there, there's probably lots of people um, in prison who the four of us don't think should be in prison. People on drug uh, charges, people on gun possession charges, things like that. Um, we would like them to be freed from prison. But as long as we're they're in prison, we insist that the government feeds them. And if the government, if, if someone were to come along and say, I'm going to abolish this government program of feeding prisoners, we would not be like, yes, less government. We're saving money. You'd be like, oh, no, now you're murdering those people. This is actually much worse than just imprisoning them. Um, likewise, there can be an order of operation, you know, so like, you're like, first you have to free, uh, th those prisoners. Then you could talk about cutting back on the food that you were giving them when government has taken over control of the borders of a country and also runs so much public property that it literally reaches up to the house of each individual American to have a compulsory opening of those borders is as much at not as non-libertarian as a compulsory closing of all of those borders. And I think that libertarians, um, unlike some of our other unpopular views, this is one that we don't have to, uh, it's an albatross we don't have to wear. And so I would encourage them to shed it. And that's all. Thanks very much, guys. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Chris, your final thoughts? Sure. I'll keep it quick too, because I know Dave has to run. Uh, yes. Yeah, so so I, I agree. I think really the disagreement all turns about or all turns on this question of what can be done with private property. Uh, I, I would just reiterate my main point, which is whatever sort of reason we want to give to restrict someone's access to private property, we want to make sure that we actually can accept its implications for cases that don't involve immigration. So here again, if the idea is that we can restrict somebody's access to private property. If that sort of restriction results in desirable political outcomes, then this opens the door to things like uh, here again, like tr uh, restricting the use of uh, or restricting the transportation of anti-libertarian literature on public roads. And I think that's a position most libertarians wouldn't want to endorse. If we can restrict someone's access to a public road on the grounds that uh, that sort of restriction results in, you know, I don't know, uh, reduced consumption of tax-funded services. That's a you know going to imply maybe that uh, somebody should not be allowed to use a public road to transport themselves to a hospital that receives public funds because that uh, might increase the consumption of uh, government-funded services. And so that's just sort of the the formula that I would use for analyzing these sorts of cases. Like, are we willing to accept the implications of this principle for cases other than immigration? And then lastly. Uh, I'll, I'll reemphasize the point uh, about the so-called keyhole solution. So if you're really worried about uh, immigration and consumption of tax-funded goods and services, then I would say the solution is not to restrict immigration. It's to restrict access to those goods and services, maybe require some sort of entrance fee, something like that, uh, because I think that that is a less restrictive solution to the problem than outright restriction of immigration. And, and I'll leave it at that, but th thanks to you all for this. Thank you guys. Thank you, so Chris. Much. This, this super was, interesting. yeah, this was a great conversation. I've, I'm very grateful to both of you for being generous with your time. Um, for our listeners, I want to remind you that we, you can email us just asking questions at reason.com. We're going to be adding a, uh, ask us questions segment. So ask us direct questions. Also feel free to suggest future guests or topics. We want to hash out lots of issues. This is a good model for like what one version of the show we want to do. So if you have other guests and topics, please send them there. Just asking questions at reason.com. Chris Fryman, Dave Smith, Liz Wolf. Thank you for joining. Thanks for talking with us today. Thanks thank so you. much, guys. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.